again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn You look back and it's all in the past I'm dwelling on the thoughts I cannot say to you If I don't say the words then maybe it's not true Hi, welcome along to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith. As always, uh, once a week, I like to get a, 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 something a little bit different on the show. And we've got a, a special guest today. It's Neil Woods from Leap. How are you, Neil? I'm all right. How are you doing, Steve? Very good, mate. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on. This follows on from uh, the uh, wonderful podcast we did with Suzanne Sharkey. And um, uh, we, we'd never had a police officer and former police officer on our channel. Um, up until uh, Suzanne appeared, and it was great to get her insight into some of the work she's done since she uh, retired from the force. And uh, want to talk to Neil about that because he's involved in the same organisations, Leap being one of them. And uh, he's also written two fantastic books, which you'll be able to get the link for below this video. Um, you can get them at Amazon, uh, Waterstones, W. H. Smiths, all good bookshops. A uh, good cop, bad war. Uh, Neil's undercover life inside Britain's biggest drug gangs, and also drug wars. The follow up. Uh, which was the terrifying inside story of Britain's drug trade, something which uh, you know I, I found particularly interesting in that book. So uh, great stuff. We'll talk a little bit about them later on. But as always, at the start of the programme, just just want to get a little bit of background, Neil, really. I mean, just first of all, where were you brought up? You know, happy childhood, etc. Yeah, happy childhood. Um, quite sheltered, as it turned out, when I found out when I joined the police. <laughs> I, I grew up in the Peak District uh, in Buxton, so um, yeah, fairly quiet childhood really. Um, went to university by mistake uh, after I finished school, uh, and what I ever, how I ever thought that business studies would be interesting, I've got no idea. I remember <laughs> sitting there in a lecture listening to this bloke warble on, I thought, I've got to get out of here. Uh, so I dropped out of university and then on a whim applied for the police. I couldn't make my mind up actually. I was either going to go backpacking around Europe or I was going to uh, try and join the police. I flipped a coin and it came up heads. Uh, so that took me on the long journey, which has brought me here today to speak to you about it, I suppose. Um, police force then, back in the deal. I mean, how, how old were you and um, and what year was it? Because I think that's often interesting because police has changed, police has changed so much in, 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 the, you know, in that length of time. It has. It was 1989 and I was 19. Uh, and I was an, I was a young nineteen, but I didn't realise I was a young nineteen until some some fool put me in a police uniform. Because um, I was I really was terrible at it to start with. I was just too young. Um, my personality hadn't necessarily developed to cope with it very well. So yeah, I really struggled as a uniform cop first couple of years. In fact, I only stayed in really just to prove to myself I could survive the first two years, which isn't. It isn't the best way to approach a um, working life, is it? The, pro the process of getting into the police force, I mean, what, what what was that like? Because, you know, obviously, you know, you, you, you're led to believe you've got to go in, you have to do, you have to be certainly fit. Um, you know, you hear about the infamous bleep test that people used to do. Did you have to do all of that, Neil? I, I predate the bleep, bleep test, to be honest. I don't think they had that technology when I started. Uh, but you did have to be fit and you had to be able to, to run a reasonable distance and time and certain fitness and the application process went on for several months there's lots of interviews you got interviewed at home and then there was a panel and then there's like um you know a collective test where you sort of advised where you, where you sort of observed in a group dynamic and how you behave in a group with group tasks so it's quite a convoluted process to get in to be honest even then um but i got in <laughs> Yeah, and, and and is the you know the the, the process uh, still the same back then? Was it probation? Did you have to basically you know learn the ropes first and foremost before you could be fully qualified as an officer? Yeah, ten weeks in in the classroom essentially, and then the first two years, every few weeks you'd have more teaching, more course, and you'd have a um, a tutor assigned as well. So you couldn't be qualified until you passed the first two years. So that's that's the sort of probationary period, and that's what I clung on to, and and uh, that, that was what I saw as was my end goal in the first two years, to be honest. Mm. 
I can hear a little problem with your sound, Neil. So what I'm going to do is I'm, we do have an ad section. I'm going to play that. It might be at your end, actually. It just seems to be crackling a little bit. So maybe you want to do something with a computer, maybe go in, come back out, whatever. But I'll, I'll play the ads now um, so we don't you know, you know, ruin the interview for the people watching back home. I can hear you, but I do appreciate that might be a little bit frustrating for those people at home. So I'll play the ads and hopefully you might be able to sort that out at your end. A big thanks to all our sponsors, Skips and Bins, telephone 0800 2545 253, email inquiries at skipsandbins.com, website skipsandbins.com, easy contract free and pay-as-you-go waste collection. Thanks to Mr. Vicky's Sources, which are handmade in Cumbria. Their website is mrvickies.co.uk. If you want to contact the guys, email info at mrvickies.co.uk or telephone 01768 210102. Big thanks to New Workwear. Uh, they are an agile and dedicated workwear provider launched in 2018. For more information, go to the website, newworkwear.com. Big thanks, as always, to Media Arts for the help with the video side of things. If you want to support the channel, hit the subscribe button, become a subscriber today. Hit the thumb up under the video, which likes the video, and click share to share to your other social media. Click join if you want to become a member of the channel for as little as one ninety nine, or take a one-off payment uh, for the cult membership. You can get in via this QR code if you've got a smartphone or look for membership pack on the website nufcmatters.com. What do you get for your one-off £25 payment? You get a scarf, a pen and a cup and a membership card and entry into the monthly draw. Don't forget if you want a car sticker, all you need to do is subscribe to the show and then email John at NUFC Matters, and he will post you a free car sticker out. We're also available as a podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast providers. And we also support the food bank on this channel. NUFCfansfoodbank.co.uk is the virtual match day bucket, where you can make a virtual donation 365 days of the year. The new Alan Shearer raffle is underway. 150 tickets at a pound a ticket. You could win a limited edition signed Alan Shearer ball from the 260 dinner. Enter now at nufcmatters.com. We've got a few events coming up. August the 5th sees Gavin Peacock at the Tyneside Irish Centre. Tickets are £10 and you can get them now from nufcmatters.com. Our Christmas event takes place on the 7th of December at the Tyneside Irish Centre. And that's an evening with Frank Clark. Tickets are £15 and available from nufcmatters.com. Finally, Waddle, Keegan, Beardsley and Friends, the class of 84, is on at the Town Theatre and Opera House on Westgate Road in Newcastle on Thursday, January the 25th. Tickets are now available from the Town Theatre and Opera House.co.uk or telephone 0844 that's the box office telephone number 0844-2491-000. Okay, welcome back, Neil. Hopefully the sound issue has, uh, has, has disappeared now. Sometimes it's just a case of rebooting the computer. Um, but yeah, we were just talking about getting into the police force. Was there anything you struggled with? Did you struggle with fitness? Did you struggle with the, the law side of it? Because, you know, I guess you have to know every single, you know, thing about it. Was there anything that you struggled with? Um, I struggled with confrontation, to be honest. Uh, I'd grown up in a sheltered place and, um, you know, I'd, I'd been brought up to think, to believe that you could reason with anybody. You know, you could talk your way through something, you could reason with anyone. And obviously, when in the police, I've found out that sometimes, however much you try to reason with someone, they'll still want to keep punching you. So <laughs> so that was a bit of a, a, a an awakening, really. Is the sound better, by the way? Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that, I just I just had a lot of growing up to do. I think. Hmm. I, I mean, can you you know remember your first arrest uh, on the beat? I can't. I think I've blanked out most of the stuff I did before undercover work. To be honest. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, obviously, not something that you, you you enjoyed a great deal. So moving from the moving from the uniform part of the job to the undercover stuff. I mean, how how did that come about? Was that something you, you applied for or, was, or were you were you asked to do it? 
It was an accident, really. Um, I was given an attachment to the drug squad. And what they were trying to do is to share the expertise of drug squad very widely. So having lots of people attached to them, which the drug squad hated because we just got in the way. Um, but one of them suggested to me I had to go at buying some crack cocaine, which is not something I was expecting. Uh, and so that, that's that's what I did. And it was all done in very simple terms to start with. They set up a quick observation point, gave me 20 quid and pointed me to this door. And but but that really changed the shape of our life because the drug squad suddenly saw that there were cheap and easy ways of getting large results because that kind of low level undercover work hadn't really happened in the UK up until that point. So this is 1993 by this point. I sort of clung in into the job and carried on. Um, and suddenly I found something that I was that I could do, something that I was I was good at. Um, so it quickly developed from a few weeks operations uh, to no time at all. I was doing no less than six or seven months. And then I was loaned out to different drug squads around the country. And then in a few years time, they consolidated the work that I did into the East Midlands Special Operations Unit. So it became a very specialist um, organization and developing the tactics all the time. Did you did you have to you know obviously blend in? I guess you have to you have to dress the part. I mean, were, were you going out with charity shops and and, and buying clothes to, to to fit in with some of these people? Yeah, I mean to start with, to be honest, I uh, I I made myself out to be a um, sort of travelling scally. Now you're from the north, so you'll understand that word, won't you? When I speak yeah. to southern audiences, they have got no idea what I mean by scally. <laughs> so I was there in my in my in my double tracksuit, you know, my matching tracksuit, my Nike Air Max trainers, that kind of thing, and that opened up a few doors, you know. But actually, I, I quickly found that dressing down and mingling with the the real problematic heroin consumers um, who are who are either homeless or living in squats or on the edge of all that. That's actually what opened up more doors. And I was able to I, I pick out the most vulnerable people in those communities to manipulate them. And if that sounds ruthless, well, it is ruthless. You know, that, that's the nature of the work I did, that the most vulnerable people are the easiest to manipulate. And quite often the most vulnerable people had the best connections as well. So I, they could introduce me further up the ladder. You mentioned the word scally there. Clearly, I knew exactly what it meant. So it was, you know, because street slang is regionalised, I would say. So, you know, in Newcastle, saying one thing could mean something completely different in East End of London. Um, you know, is that something you, you would have to, you know, you'd have to learn, you'd have to pick up, um, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to study? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, street slang amongst the problematic heroin and crack cocaine community, it varies even more, actually. You can be using different terminology from one town to another in the same county. Yeah. So yeah, you did quickly have to pick up whether whether you're asking for um, for for bees, bees and wasps, or brandy and whiskey, or brown and white, or light and dark, or it goes on and on and on, and it's so regional. Um, and you know, if you're talking about smoking heroin, are you boning it? Are you beetling it? There's so many. You know, there's a there's a book to to write in all of the slang. I think um, it's extraordinary amount quantities of it. I guess as well, you know, one of the dangers in this job is, you know, integrating yourself with with people to start with, because one would imagine in that world there is paranoia, mainly brought on by the drugs, but also brought on by you know you know the, the situation these people find themselves in um and i guess you, you've got to you've got to distinguish who you are and why you're there so you you need to create a backstory yeah exactly um which i've referred to as a legend that, that's that's the sort of word we use in in covert um policing and yeah sometimes you see as the years went on it got more and more difficult and that the some people and the reason but one of the main reasons people were so unpredictable and violent is because of the, my presence in their marketplace. Because before where I started doing that work, it was actually not that difficult an environment. Um, but it was the presence of police in that environment or the presence of police informants, which actually causes the violence. Because why, why is there any need for threat without the police there? And that made it violent, more violent uh, and difficult for everybody, more paranoid, more unpredictable. So, yeah, with every passing year I did the work, the streets got more dangerous. 
and you know actually you have to face up to the fact that's because of policing drugs or trying to police drugs in the current regime i guess in the early days of you know these covert operations that you found yourself in it was probably easy to an extent but you know villains will always catch on to these new methods and you know ultimately for you that would make your job harder i guess neil yeah, it quickly became harder. I had to put much more detail into legend development and befriending people. It, yeah, it, it became incredibly much dif more difficult. It, I suppose one of the early signs that of the direction of travel of how difficult it was going to be was um, when I knocked on a heroin dealer's door in in Stoke, Stoke on Trent, and I got to know this guy. I mean, I thought he trusted me. I thought I had no problem with him. But I entered the door one day, put a samurai sword to my throat which is quite unsettling. Um, but actually, he was so angry. He was His face was blood red and saliva just flying out as he's screaming at me. You're fucking DS, man. You're drug squad. I know you are. I know you are. And I'm thinking, oh, well, time's up then. I'm, I, I, that's it. Because I could feel this, this cold steel on my throat. And then suddenly he started laughing. And this woman who stood behind him started laughing as well. And she said, um, wow, I thought you were going to say you were then. And they were just winding me up. Maybe he just wanted to try out his new sword. I don't know. But but it was a sort of indication that the whole market was just getting more violent. And safety, people's safety depends on the reputation that they can portray. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're the person who can be the most intimidating, you're not the person who gets grassed up. You know, so if you're, if you're scary, it helps you. Um, and so that was one of the first indications. And so I bought four wraps of heroin from him after after he put the sword away <laughs> and i'm starting to walk away from that address putting the the four wraps into a cigarette packet and i look up and there's a knife pointing into my stomach someone's trying to rob me for the heroin that i've just bought so I talk about frying pan and fire so he's i'm thinking there's no way i'm letting go of this after what i've just been through so i started trotting backwards and sort of quickly ran backwards and i could run faster than him and I'll never forget what he, what he said, this guy. He said, no, hang on a minute. Just come here a minute. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> Mate, you want me to come here? You've got that blade. Are you mad? Uh, anyway, I, I managed to sort of run away from him and, and get back to the safe location. But that was definitely a taxing day at the office, so to speak. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, did you ever face, you know, somebody with a gun, Neil? Yeah, I, I mean, I saw a gun while I was operating a few times. First time in Derby in about 1998, something like that. Um, guy just had it. When he told me to get pick the wraps up, I had to lean into the car. I mean, I looked down to the floor of the car. There was a gun leaning against his ankle, which is sort of strange that he would let me see that, really. But, but I suppose the most, um, well, it is the most intense time I was faced with a gun was uh, when I was working infiltrating the burger bar boys now I'd it's very I'm sometimes I speak in different countries and they laugh because it's, it's a very British name for a gang that the burger bar boys but they're not as fluffy as they sound they were really brutal they, they used sexual violence as part of their reputation building kidnappings maimings that kind of thing one of them was implicated in seven different murders Re really um, intense gang but i'd known them and had been buying heroin and crack from them for about two months and so i thought again i thought they they trusted me and one day i was a bit unsettled by the way they were behaving to me so the next day because i'd started to wear a camera i'd actually started to you don't do that straight away you wait until you think someone trusts you and i started to wear a camera but the next day i thought no, I'm not going to wear this today. Something wrong in the way that they were treating me yesterday. And I'm really glad I made that decision because when I met them that day, they put bundled me in the back of a vehicle, took me to this not really secluded place, but this, this area with, with some trees near to the race course in the centre of Northampton. And um, they said, right, Strip, you're DS, man. You're fucking 5-0. You're 5-0. And just as I was about to protest, another one lifted his shirt up and, sh and uh, showed me a gun tucked into uh, at the top of his tracksuit bottoms. 
Now, it's really strange what goes through your head, or rather, it's quite strange what's gone through my head at times of extreme adrenaline, because there's two things entered my head. One was, you're not old enough to have seen Hawaii Five-0. And he's using the slang five o. That's when that was my first thought. And then when I saw the gun into the top of the tracksuit bottoms, I'm thinking, how on earth are those tracksuit bottoms holding that gun up? Because <laughs> they, you know, they're heavier than they look. If you've ever held them, they're heavier than you look. And those are the things that went through my head. Um, but of course, then I realised that I was going to have to do what I was told. Um, they weren't. They weren't pissing around at all. But even so, I, I mean, I don't know to this day whether they really had any suspicion or whether they just decided it was a point to remind me who was boss. You know, that's, that's, that's what they were about. They were about intimidation and, um, and that was intimidating. I can imagine. I, I mean, is there ever a moment where you, you've had a close escape and maybe forgotten a bit of detail? Because I can imagine as well, it, it's like telling a lie. You know, if you tell a lie, you've got to be good at telling a lie because you can always trip yourself up and somebody finds out. And, you know, your, your, your cover's blown, I guess. So has there ever been a situation where your memories let you down? No, actually. Um, one thing I was really good at that I developed was maintaining the lies. And actually, I really enjoyed the intellectual exercise of maintaining those lies. And sometimes it could get really complicated because I would be in a community and having to remember details I was talking about. And no, I never missed a note with that. Um, that was one thing I had is a perfect clarity and able to maintain maintain those lies. So it's one of the reasons I suppose I thrived at that kind of work. But but I have, um, I suppose the one time my response let me down. So in other words, it was my own uh, mistake which actually put me in danger, was an operation where I've been infiltrating this pub. And it was a weird place because it, it was in a village near to the border with Leicester, Leicestershire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, a village called Whittick. And I've been infiltrating this pub because it, it was like a meeting place of organised crime from three cities. It was a weird place. It's, you, it's like a cartoon pub. You, you, it's hard to believe it, but it's just a village pub full of gangsters and full of scallies and just, it was a remarkable place. A bit like the Star um, Wars bar. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a bit like that. It was, but in this village, it's so strange, you know, re really, really odd. It's just casual, the casual violence in there as well over, over uh, debts that people had to each other. Anyway, the most violent and the main, um, the main target for my operation was a big antique burglar. He was a big organized car thief, but also a cocaine, um, uh, dealer and the mis one of the, the, the mis my mistake began with that by basically making myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines and I'm not a connoisseur of amphetamines at all but it gave me something to talk about because you know I can talk this shit I can talk methamphetamine I can talk old-fashioned blues you know all, the, all of that kind of stuff anyway this main target came to me one day and he held up he said I've got a present for you and held up this little sealy bag and in it was this sort of toxic looking pink goo in it. And you could smell instantly. It was really strong based on vitamin. It smelled like the urine from a glue sniffing cat, like, like really toxic. You could almost see it dissolving the plastic bag. Anyway, um, he was obviously expecting me to try it. And I must have had a momentary flash of reticence across my face, just a flash. And I know that because I saw a momentary flash of suspicion across his face and I realized at that point that I had to pour water on that fire of suspicion or I was in big trouble like real trouble so I had to show sudden enthusiasm uh, so I stuck my finger in swallowed a, swallowed a lump and then he looked at me and said you're going to need more than that with your tolerance I'm thinking oh great so I put my finger in again another lump you know I could always feel it dissolving the, uh, my, my tongue as it went in and Quite quickly, I felt the sort of rising heat and I was starting to come up. And it was ridiculously strong. I mean, the average amphetamine at the time was 5% pure. This was 40% pure. And of course, I had no tolerance. Now, I, I, I knew enough about the drug that I wasn't going to overdose. You know, you need to take a huge amount of amphetamine to actually overdose on it. But it was beyond comfortable. It was, it was not a pleasant experience at all. I remember I had to get driven home. 
And I remember thinking, I've got eight cans of lager in my fridge at home. That'll take the edge off. I remember finishing the eighth can and feeling no different at all. <laughs> like no different. My, just my brain screaming. Um, I didn't really sleep properly for three nights, but my house has never been so tidy. <laughs> That's a classic. Great story. Um, I, one thing I did read about uh, was your experience in Northampton and... Um, that must have been rather terrifying to find out that the criminals there had devised a, a new punishment for informants. Yeah, well, that's that's the Burger Bar boys who I just referred to who, stri who stripped me that time. And yeah, the sexual violence they were using, um, they were they were gang raping people for drug debts or where they suspected them of being informants. In fact, one one of the um, one of the days that where I was um, deployed that day I was told that the car that I'd been I'd got into with them the day before was now if, if I see it it's going to be a crime scene because they, they they've had intelligence that there was a, a gang rape committed in that car the night before so I had to be prepared to sort of do a swap of clothing because my clothing might become crime scene that kind of thing um, but they they change cars this the car had been burnt out they were very careful with what they did um yeah they, they were they were genuinely pretty br brutal people to be honest um i mean they're, they're infamous some some people listening to this might know some of their crimes they did just a few months before uh, one of the people that i was buying heroin from had supplied the machine guns for an infamous double murder in birmingham um of two young women letitia shakespeare and charmaine harris so, you know, that, that was the sort of, um, that was the calibre of people that I was infiltrating there. But, I mean, it, that took seven months, that operation. It took me several weeks to get an introduction directly to them, which was, that was intense because I had four hooded figures circling me and punching me and headbutting me while another one interrogated me. Um, so that was that was my introduction to them. So I'd taken a real dislike to them by the end of that operation. So I was very pleased when um, we realised that I'd gathered evidence against the whole team and all of their support, all of it. So I'd got evidence against 96 people, the six main gangsters, six main burger bar boys and 90 other people. And I knew there was no one else to meet. There was no one, no names I hadn't already I hadn't met, no new phone numbers that I hadn't got already. I thought, wow, this is going to just, this is going to sweep the streets clean. This is going to be such a massive operation. So there was police brought in from five different counties, hundreds of cops involved in the enforcement phase of the operation. And I remember speaking to the intelligence, op uh, intelligence guy who was tasked with, keeping his ear to the ground as to the impact and he said to me yep we managed to interrupt the drug supply in Northampton for a whole two hours seven months of work being quite convinced I was going to die on multiple occasions hundreds of police involved all those resources just to interrupt the drug supply for two hours and you know having had years and years of doubt about the, eff the effectiveness and the the impact of the work I was doing you, know, you can't ignore that that that's that's more than just um more than just futile because well it is futile but it's also it's just causing harm because police are really good at catching drug dealers you know I used to be they are all over if you give them twice the resources they'll catch twice as many but they never shrink the size of the market the market stays the same. So if you get rid of one gang, all you're doing is you're providing an opportunity for somebody else. More often than not, actually, that opportunity is fought over. So you increase the violence. And it's, it's the streets are getting perpetually more violent and there's a this constant doing and throwing between the police and organised crime. But drugs policing sharpens the sword of organised crime. It, it has and continues to make organised crime more effective, more ruthless, and we can't win this war. We can't win it. it. Yeah, I would agree 100%. I mean, did you come across 
corrupt officers. I mean, there are good and bad in every in every industry, and you know, I, I presume you must have come across some colleagues who were um, taking a little bit off the top, shall we say? Well, this is another problem with problem with our current drug policy. It's our drug policy which is corrupting the police, the criminal justice system, and and a wider society. And I'll give you, I'll explain something that, um, that highlights that. So, whenever I was loaned out by MSU, the Special Operations Unit, to a different constabulary to do some work, that constabulary would have to set up a certain model, a, a, a team to support me, and they would have to be completely separate from normal policing for the length of the operation. They wouldn't be able to speak to their colleagues. The uh, operation would be set up in a new place, like they'd rent an empty farmhouse or something like that. Um, so there'd be no contact between that team and normal policing. I'd have to have an intel guy, a tech guy, backup, a senior investigating officer. And that team, just before I got there, would be given a lawful order. And that lawful order would be, you will not ask the undercover operative his real name, where he's from, or any personal details. If you do, you will be disciplined. And that lawful order was signed. It was a very, it's a very big thing, the lawful order in policing. It's an impacted thing. You know if you break that lawful order, you could get sacked. So that was all set up. But that's set up to protect me. So in other words, I was using the same pseudonym with the police as I was to the gangsters. And the cops that I worked with know who I was. That's to protect me from corruption. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is to make the point that those systems aren't needed for anything else, only drugs investigations. And the very fact that those systems are in place is in itself clear evidence of the extent of the problem. If only the public knew this, if only the public understood the lengths police go to to fight the corruption that they can't fight, so despite those systems, I remember for the for the an operation I did in uh, Nottinghamshire, um, it had been a really long week. I think the, 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 the evening before, I finally met this gangster after four and a half months of work, and he'd interrogated me with a, a knife pressed into my groin. Now that's unsettling. It really unsettling. It's difficult to have a conversation uh, and remember your lines when, when that's happening. And he was weird because he brought his 12 year old son with him to watch that as well. Um, and we dressed in the same two piece tracksuit, same trainers, same shaved head, same gold chain. Anyway, that meant, you know, after all of that intensity, my um, my senses are really fine tuned. You know, I was really sensitive to body language, um, you know, feeling that threat. So the next morning, I was introduced to two new cops because two of my backup team had gone sick. The first one I met, I had no problem with. The second one shook his hand and just the hairs went up on the back of my neck. And, you know, everything about this guy was wrong. So I went to the senior investigating officer. I said, look, boss, I cannot have this guy knowing what I'm doing. I don't trust him. And the boss was great. He said, well, we'll exclude them both. So they're not asking any questions. They've not been in the briefing. They don't know anything about this yet. It's fine. We'll just run and run short staffed. I put it out of my mind. But 12 months later, it turned out that that person I'd taken an exception to was an employee of the gangsters that I was trying to infiltrate. And actually, he got closer to my inner circle by a long way than I had to his. Um, he was a guy called Charlie Fletcher. And he'd been in the police for seven years. But this is the important point. He was paid to join the police. So he was employed by organised crime to join the police. He was in, he'd been in the police for seven years by the time I met him. He was receiving £2,000 a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. Now, in the, in the debrief for that, I remember one senior cop saying to me, well, Woodsy, we know this happens. Of course this happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? And again, if the public knew uh, and understood how much senior police accept the existence of this corruption, again, I think we would have policy change much, much quicker. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to explain this and for, for people to hear this, because it's important that we understand. But it's not just the money 
that makes this corruption inevitable because and it is it is i mean it's a huge amount of money there is no other form of criminality that can pay for that level of corruption nothing nothing at all but it's not just the value it's the fact that by trying to police drugs in this regime actually causes the corruption because what you're doing is your police are constantly thinning out the competition you know you get rid of a dealer the dealer is most likely to take up that opportunity is, is a rival dealer and they increase their share of the market. If you increase your share of the market, you've got more disposable income. And if you've got more disposable income, you will always invest it in corruption, always, because that's the business model. So by policing these drug markets, we're accelerating that journey, accelerating the levels of corruption. And that happens all over the world. It happens you know, in the, U in the UK, happens in every other country. I talk about this in, it, it happens regionally, happens internationally. You know, there used to be 20 cartels in Mexico. Now there's three. Those three, those, and those cartels have a bigger GDP than most West African countries. You know, the, the corruption caused by drug prohibition is a crisis. And for me... You know, we've, we've had this conversation on this channel before uh, with, with other people on our news programme. It, it's about, you know, the regulation of drugs, you know, legalisation. Um, you know, it, it's time that maybe there was a government brave enough to, 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 to look at this seriously. I mean, I think for me, um, it, it's a funny way of looking at it, I guess, but I know you, you share the same sentiment that it's, it's not really criminals that cause crime, it's opportunity. You know that you know from 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 your perspective. I think I've I've, I've seen a quote that you, you you gave on that, and you know there is no other crime other than dealing drugs, which gives a youngster, let's say a, a teenager, 15, 14, 15 year old, a, a chance to make anything near the money that they can make off dealing drugs in the playground with so little risk of being caught. And and this is where county lines comes in. I mean, it, it's terrifying. And Northumbria Police at the moment are doing a, a you know doing a sweep on county lines you know they are they are constantly tackling that problem up here and lots of arrests being made lots of people's doors going through and um you know from from my perspective it's um it, it, it's i guess for the taxpayer and, and for the local person who probably doesn't even know that this is going on that we're talking to today really you know, you know it'll be a bit of a shock to them but it, it's going on in front of them and there's been i picked up these a couple of hard-hitting things from Essex police, uh, Neil, you know, who's controlling your friends? These, these, ad, these adverts about children, you know, and, and literally being used by the, the, the drug dealers and uh, to, 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 to move drugs around. It's, it's terrifying really, Neil. Um, I mean, most people sleep safely in their beds at night, not, not, not even knowing this is going on, but you know, you've been heavily involved in it. I have an interest in true crime. Um, you know, I read a lot about it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's shocking me, and and it is for me time. I think to at least look at starting with cannabis and seeing where you go. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm glad you mentioned county lines. Now, this exploitation of children is is a is a specific. It's a crisis specific to um, to the UK. Um, there are fifty thousand children on the front line dealing heroin, crack, cocaine in the UK. And this is a, in a European context, this is a UK problem. Well, the only other country that has this problem like that for the problematic markets is Sweden, um, because they have an even more oppressive, punitive uh, drug policy than we do. But people need to be asking why we, we now have children on the front line. And that, that's my fault. It's the fault of police, in, police using informants. It's an adaptation. We've caused this to happen. Organised crime has adapted because children are the perfect buffer zone between the police and, 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 and them. It, it, it protects the adults to use children. So we've caused this. And you are absolutely right that the only answer really is to take legal control of these drugs away from criminals. And, you know, how bad do things have to get before we seriously do that? You know, we can't... These 50,000 children and more because, you know, these clampdowns and... You get a gang and rescue kids. It just means more kids get sucked into it. So the numbers are going up all the time. It's it's a lie to say that these activities in Northum by Northumbrian police or anywhere else in the country are having any success in reducing crime or protecting children because they're not. There is no evidence of that. And there's clear evidence of the opposite. But I, I would suggest actually what we need to do is start with heroin, not cannabis. 
Could we, of course, we should have a legal cannabis market, but just down the road feed from you in Middlesbrough, up until last December, there was the answer to, to county, county lines, to protecting children. And that is they had dimorphine assisted treatment in a clinic prescribing legal heroin to, to the most problematic consumers in that society, in that community. Um, because if you can supply people who are using heroin problematically, that destroys the business model, which is using children to deal with heroin, destroys it. So it's a double impact. You can actually take care of people who need help, people who are self-medicating for childhood trauma with heroin. You can take care of them rather than leave them to the exploitation of organised crime. Mm. And the secondary effect of taking care of them is you prevent children being exploited to deal it. So it's a double win. Um, and so, I mean, that clinic was run by a brilliant uh, man called Danny Ahmed um, from the Foundations Clinic. And it was in part paid for originally by the Cleveland Police and Crime Commissioner. Unfortunately, the current police and crime commissioner pulled the funding um, through a combination, in my view, of stupidity and political cowardice. Um, and you know, I'm, I met with him. I met with him at the Conservative Party conference and spent time explaining the evidence and the impact that this would have. And I thought he'd listened, but clearly he hadn't because last December the rug was pulled from that and vulnerable people who'd been given a lifeline, that lifeline was taken away. And one of the incredible pieces of evidence from that clinic that every police com crime commissioner should pay attention to is the dramatic reduction in crime it created. An incredible reduction in crime. Every police and crime commissioner should be expending, spending money on similar systems and actually be more ambitious and spread it. You know, to see how many people you can bring in because the more people you look after, the safer our society will be. Yeah, it's an epidemic. Um, you know, I, I've, I've made a post a, a few weeks back just walking through the streets of Newcastle. Uh, I didn't put anybody on camera, but I, I was I was midday. I, I'm not being funny. It was an awful experience. It's my city, the, the, you know, the place where I grew up, grew up. And, you know, there are countless poor individuals on the streets just, you know, off the heads for want of a better expression Neil but you know you know some of these people may be homeless some of these people may have a home and are simply there you know either begging or shoplifting to try and to, to get the next hit it, it, it's not a nice place and of course that you go into prison the prisons are full and you know prison doesn't re doesn't rehabilitate what prison does do at the moment is probably get those who aren't hooked on drugs hooked on drugs to then come back out, out into society to create, you know, to commit another crime. It's 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 a horrendous situation we're in and it doesn't get talked about enough, Neil. No, I agree. And the prison thing is is very important because I saw one, one study which suggested that two in five people who, who use heroin first tried it in prison. What an indictment that is of the of the of, of criminalizing people. But also, I mean it's also it's incredibly stupid to send people to prison well, most people to prison for anything, to be honest, but to send someone who's got a problem with drugs to prison because heroin costs four times as much in prison. That's the, that's the going rate in the UK, four times as much. And you can build up a lot of debt in prison by using heroin. It's the same gangs on the inside as it is on the outside. So what that does is it creates pressure to commit more crime when you come out. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just insanity. Um, but that's the political reality that we need to be explaining to our politicians. They, they, you know, this get tough rhetoric, this nonsense that they come out with, it it's, makes no sense at all. No, no, definitely not. I mean, the good thing is that people like yourself are fighting the good fight to try and make a difference, lobbying MPs, speaking to MPs, going, you know, going to, you know, these party conferences and, um, you know, hopefully at some point, you know, something might change. Getting back to your, your own personal experience, I mean, you, you eventually left the, the police force and, um, you know, PTSD is, is, I guess, what you were what you were diagnosed with. There was a particular name for it, wasn't there, Neil, that they, they diagnosed you with? Yeah, I've got uh, CPTSD, so uh, Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Um, and, it, and it is complicated, uh, you know, after 
three psychiatrists, multiple psychiatric nurses and therapists and things. I, I think I, I understand it reasonably well. Mine's it's quite complicated because part of my PTSD is moral injury. And a moral injury was first di diagnosed in uh, veterans coming back from the Vietnam War. Uh, essentially a profound sense of guilt for the harm that they've caused. Um, so part of that is that and part of my PTSD is obviously the near death experiences um, that I've had more than I can remember, to be honest. And then, and then I think, and part of it as well, which is the difficult thing for me that I can't, that it's the, the hardest thing for me to process is I think when I was still doing undercover work, I was already, uh, I already had PTSD. So I was layering it on top and, you know, I had long periods of time where, you know, I'm stuck in a fight or flight situation because I felt at risk, but because I was doing the job, I kept myself there. So it's this sort of constant fighting that fight or flight response. So I think that's where the complexity bit comes in, that it's it's multi-layered. Um, I mean, I have more days, more good days than bad nowadays. Um, and I'm going through a particularly good period at the moment. I had a bit of a difficult one last November, but for the most part, I'm doing okay at the moment. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is the fact that a lot of the work that I'm doing with Leap and other people is is, is tangibly having some influence um, here and there. So I suppose the fight keeps me going, really. <laughs> Maybe that's always been the case. Yeah, that's great stuff. So let's move on to the books. Uh, Good Cop, Bad War. Um, was 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 your first book, and uh, I think you said at the top of the show you're, you're quite an introvert kind of person. So to write a book must have been quite um, stressful, but therapeutic, maybe Neil. Yeah, I found it really stressful, to be honest. Um, I mean, you say stressful writing a book, yeah, but the the difficult stuff, the talented stuff, was done by J. S. Raffaele, my co-writer, and certainly for the memoir. I think his skill is was knowing what to leave out because you know I splurged him with all this information. We did endless interviews over and over and over, you know, and him asking me questions and really steering me through stuff. So he says, "Okay, so when you went in the room, what colour was the carpet?" You know, what like really extracting these details out. Um, so that yeah, that was quite that was quite hard work. That was quite difficult. But in terms of the skill, the writing down that that's all that's all down to JS. Great, great book. Well worth a read. And you followed it up with, with Drug Wars. So the first one must have done well, Neil. Yeah, the first one has done well. Um, I mean, as, as well as books do, you know, that... Um, unless, yeah, you're JK it, it, Rowl, unless you're J.K. Rowling, Neil, you're never going to be a millionaire, I'm afraid. No, 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 that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, but drug, drug Wars, we wanted to just try and explain to people the change over time, you know, that... that it doesn't have to be this way that actually the UK is in a really straight, a really unusual place in that we were quite late to full on drug prohibition. You know, we used to have the British system so that up until the end of the 1960s, if you developed a problem with heroin or cocaine, you just got help. You got help from the doctor. And part of that help was you'd be prescribed a safe supply of that drug. You know, that's our recent history. And it's very clear what's happened to the UK as a result of that change in drug policy. So we wanted to explain that. And and I, I, th I think we did it in an entertaining way as well, with good interviews and some real fascinating stories in there. So, I'm, but it was, a, it was, took a long time to research and a lot of people to interview. It was, it was um, yeah, it was a, it was a full-time job for over a year, um, that book. Which sort uh, of yeah. put me off doing another one, to be honest. It's hard uh, work. <laughs> Well, yeah, it is, but it's, you know, people enjoy them, you know, it, 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 it's well worth doing again. It's always well worth putting out there. And if it helps you, you, you know, the cause that you're, uh, that you're supporting, then, uh, then you know, it, it's a good cause to get behind. Leap UK, then tell us a little bit about that. What, what, what is it? Because people have heard us refer to it. They heard us refer to it on the, uh, the interview that I did with uh, Suzanne as well. Just uh, give, us a, give us a brief oversight into the work you do with Leap. Okay, so Leap is actually an international organisation. It started in the USA. Um, I'm on the board for the organization in the States and I'm chair of the organization in Europe and of course Leap, Leap UK. Um, so we're a, we're a group of police, both serving and former police who, and other law enforcement as well. You know, we have prison governors, we have um, 
uh, magistrates, ju judges we have in, in, in North America and Latin America. Um, and we are a growing movement of people from that profession who campaign for an, an evidence-based drug policy. So in, in the UK, we have um, one of our main outreaches is the Stop and Search podcast hosted by our director, Jason Reed. And if you haven't heard that, you know, there's, there's lots of back catalogue of episodes. We've got amazing interviews with people like Marcus Brigstock and Rufus Hound and lots and lots of supporters on there. And, um, you know, we do a lot of advocacy. You know, we have events in Parliament and we do the conferences, um, lots of media. You know, we, we, we tend to be quite often go the go-to pundits on, on our topics. Um, I mean, this week I'm speaking, oh, what am I doing this week? Um, talk TV on Thursday night, you know, so we get these, you know, we get these TV gigs. Um, and we're, we're expanding all the time, but we're sort of expanding in terms of recruitment faster than, faster than we can cope with at the moment, especially across Europe. Um, we did a, a series of events across Europe last year and, yeah, we're struggling to cope with actually managing our new membership. It's um, things are having to sort of take structure at the moment and, and try and be regionalised. But we've got a huge interest in, in the Netherlands. Amazing in Spain, you know, national mu uh, news coverage. Uh, great events in France as well, Paris and Nice. Um, yeah, so we're, we're looking forward to doing more of that in the next in the next uh 12 months and, and beyond but if anyone is able to help us with funding or fundraising or if they want to plan an event and help us do an event just please get in touch you know we're, we're, we're always always looking to do more yeah well I, I said to suzanne i'll say it to you as well if there's anything i can do neil i'm more than happy to get involved um you know and, and help certainly events was my 40 for 25 years i used to put on lots of events so you know maybe it's a conversation we're gonna have away from the, the camera i, I also want to uh, publicize anyone's child uh, which again is uh, something that I know you are involved in tell us a little bit about this yeah anyone's child are are, are our most important partners in the UK um, and we have the most impact working with them and they're they're amazing they're essentially a group of families who come together who've who've been affected profoundly by uh, current drug policy so there, it was founded by Anne-Marie Coburn, who lost her 15-year-old daughter to an accidental MDMA overdose. But they're, they're just incredible people. And they're, they're, again, they've, they've grown and they've become a very efficient campaigning machine. But what's very effective is when we can stand on it, we can do an event. Um, you know, I'm myself or Suzanne or someone else from Leap is stood next to a parent who's lost their child. And we're saying the same things. We're saying, suggesting the same solutions that's a very powerful combination. And we always get journalist interest. We always get a political interest. In fact, one of our most impactful events was in Newcastle Cathedral last November. Amazing. We've got great support from the cathedral itself. You know, uh, the vicar there spoke. Incredible event. And, you know, we, I would love to do more in the Northeast because what I've found is the Northeast is one of the places where you get an audience, you really get an audience, you get people coming and turning up and engaging. You can't say that about, that about all of the UK. You know, there are some communities which have more passion and and want to get involved and talk about this than others. And certainly the North East is definitely a collection of those communities. So again, I'd love to do one in Middlesbrough, um, if only to bait the police and crime commissioner there, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but, you know, anywhere in that region, we'd love to do. Last question, Neil. Um, do you ever think you can win this war? Do you think we'll ever look in the future and look back and say, why didn't we do that sooner? We'll win the war by a peace treaty. And the peace treaty is legal regulation. The only way we can win this is to take the power away from organised crime. I have to believe we can do that. Um, and I have to be optimistic because you know I'm a full-time activist. This is my daily existence. So if I wasn't optimistic, I would probably uh, struggle <laughs> to get get out of bed in the morning. So um, yeah, I do think it's possible, and and things are changing. You know, they are changing. Switzerland has widespread heroin-assisted treatment. Um, so does the Netherlands. They don't. 
as a result, they don't have an opioid crisis. They don't have the same drug deaths as us. So the evidence is there and it is happening. The cannabis markets, you know, Germany's about to go legal. Um, the Netherlands is doing an experiment of legal regulation. Malta's just gone legal. They're talking about it right across across Europe. Um, obviously, North America has got legal markets. In the Netherlands, when we did our event there, we were talking about legally controlled MDMA. And that is a actual, that is a mainstream political conversation in the Netherlands. So, yeah, change is coming. It's happening. We just have to speed it up in the UK. And anyone listening to this, if you agree with me, then you are part of the movement for change. You are part of it. And your responsibility is to spread the word. So thank you all for that. Neil Woods, absolute pleasure uh, to interview you. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, best of luck with it. Uh, you've got a supporter here in the Northeast. Good luck with uh, your, your journey, mate. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot, Steve. Nice chatting with you. We still do seven NUFC Matters show a week for free. But if you want to help support NUFC Matters, then there are a few ways of doing it. Hit the like button on each live broadcast and video. This helps the channel grow. Hit the subscribe button and select the all notifications bell so you don't miss a single show. If you want to help us financially, then you can join the channel using this button with the membership starting at $1.99 a month. Or you can drop us a donation in the chat using a super sticker. We're also looking for sponsors. If you'd like your brand advertised on the flies for the show and featured during the ad break, then email john at nufcmatters.com to arrange today. Mr. Stevens says, I'm arresting you on suspicion of armed robbery. You do not have to say anything, but anything you do say...